Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast. My name is Mike Ndavina, and thanks for hanging out with me today. Today, my guest is George Perks, and if you're not familiar with George, George is a recording engineer and producer based out of the UK. He's worked with some awesome artists, including Enter Shikari, The Darkness, Skindred, Black Foxes, Mogwai, and a whole bunch more. And in this chat, we have a great conversation all about the idea of making mixes sound exciting and what goes into doing that. Taking into consideration things like contrast, energy, and finding ways to create movement through either automation or panning or tracking techniques, all that kind of stuff. And when you listen to George's tracks, George does an amazing job of making mixes sound really, really entertaining. Like they're not just a static mix where you hear the same thing throughout the song from beginning to end. Instead, he's got a lot of movement in his songs. You'll hear little bits of ear candy pop in and out of a mix. His vocals don't just sound dry and boring. They actually have some movement in them as well, which keeps things entertaining. And I just really appreciate that. I really enjoy his style of mixing. You know, he, he really does focus on making mixes that sound entertaining, and that's really what it comes down to at the end of the day. You know, obviously, we want to showcase an artist in the best way possible, and part of that is to not only just record their tracks well, but also to make their songs sound exciting and to find ways that we can keep the listener engaged and wanting to listen from beginning to end over and over again. And when you make mixes that have movement, when you make mixes that have all these little bits of ear candy that we talk about here, it makes people want to listen more because they ha- they don't always catch things on the first listen. You know, it keeps them entertained. And yeah, I, I think you're going to really enjoy all of the stuff that George talks about in this episode because there's a lot of great tips that you can take to make your song sound better and more exciting. So with that said, let's just jump right into this one. George Perks, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. What's going on, man? Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Mike. Of course. For people who might not be familiar with you and what you do and how you got into everything you're working on these days, can you give us that backstory? Yeah, so I'm primarily a recording engineer. I also produce and I mix and I do a bit of songwriting too. Um, I also dabble in some mastering. I'm sort of a jack of all trades, master of none, as they say. I think Um, you have to be these days. Yeah, well, that's it. And I think it was more of a needs must to get into a bit of everything and you know, having a few different revenue streams is kind of what makes up the modern producer, I think. Mm-hmm. Having a few different revenue streams, I think, is a, a must these days because, um, you know, the, the lines, the boundaries between the different jobs of engineering and producing and, and mixing, those lines are all becoming quite blurred these days. So yeah. I have to do a bit of everything. I agree. Well, so, so as far as how you got into that, then, like, uh, where did that all start for you? Well, I played guitar in a, in a band in high school. And I was really into science and really into maths. And I wanted to do some kind of career to do with physics, you know, to do with space, something cool like that. And uh, as I got older into my teen years, I realized I wasn't, um, <laughs> I wasn't as quick as I needed to be. And I got into a band and our, our local recording studio had some downtime at the weekends. So all of our parents clubbed together and um, bought us a weekend's worth of studio time. And I walked in and it just changed my life. I realized it was everything that I loved. It was kind of science and technical, but really creative and really passionate. And um, yeah, and yeah, literally that weekend just, I got obsessed. I think I was about 15 years old and I never left. <laughs> <laughs> um, I told my mom that they'd given me a, a job, basically giving me like work experience, you know, an internship. So I asked her to, to drop me off and I sort of wave her off at the gate and then I sort of ring on the bell and be like, hey, it's me again. You let me in. Like, I'll do anything. I'll clean your car or make cups of tea, like whatever. I just wanted to be around it. And then, yeah, after a few weekends of that, they sort of gave me a summer internship. And that studio ran for about six months at that point, And then it closed. Um, and I basically got, I just got the bug from it so bad that I saved loads of money doing a paper round and I bought a, a secondhand MacBook on eBay and a microphone and I would just record all of my mates, all of my bands and yeah, just anyone that I could. And I did that for a while and then I got an internship at a studio called Punch in Ipswich 
and which is a primarily sort of analog based recording studio and we would track multi track to you know 24 track tape 24 track 2 inch um, recording bands live all together doing a mix up the desk and committing that to a two track studio machine and it wasn't because we needed to like this was around 2010 so we really didn't like need to like pro tools has been great but it was more just for the style like for the sound of it and the aesthetic of it and it was quite hard to replicate that sound back then um plus the commitment vibe of everyone playing together it was so important um so yeah i kind of like learned that way and then whilst I was studying for three years as well. And when that came to an end, I realized I wasn't sort of busy enough out in Ipswich to make it into a career. Although the studio was amazing and the team there were amazing, I kind of made the decision to move to London and got a job in a studio called The Crypt, which is in the church studios in Cratch End. Um, and that was my first sort of proper staff engineer job. And yeah, we would record... <laughs> So many different types of projects, rock bands, pop bands, um, like you name it, like everything in between. Uh, London is such a diverse, fast paced city and you never know who's coming in. Um, and yeah, there was such a wealth of music and creativity there and you know, all sorts of projects doing things like live streams and live, you know, live videos and um, we did a lot of day trotter sessions there. And for people who don't know, day trotter was a like streaming music service, but all of the songs were live sessions, exclusive live sessions. And the band would record, they had like a two hour slot and they'd have to turn up. We'd have to set up their gear, get a sound up and run in and record four or five songs to two track tape, and just commit done in two hours. And we would do like three or four bands back to back. So that first six months of being in, in, in London at the crypt, baptism by fire but it's how I cut <laughs> my teeth really um, and yeah I did that for a few years and then I started working with Adrian Bushby who really taught me everything I know like for those who don't know Adrian's a rock um, mixer engineer but does a lot of production these days as well um, he's most known for his work with Muse and Foo Fighters and yeah I did, a, did one session with Aids. And he was the first sort of named engineer, like someone I knew whose you know, name was on the back of some of my favorite CDs growing up. And he, yeah, and I, so I thought, well, do you know what? I need to be like really attent attentive on this. Like I, I normally am anyway, but I thought, you know, I'm going to learn a lot from this guy. So I made sure that first day he, uh, you know, got good service from me in the studio. <laughs> and um, yeah, he sort of took me under his wing after that. And um, I did a couple of years, like a few years with Aid, engineering for him. And we would go away and record pro projects, lots of different studios, and do some mixing as well. And then one day we went to Beta Studios, which is a residential studio in, out in the countryside in Stratford-upon-Avon. And we recorded a band called The Darkness, did an album with them. Um, and, Love those guys. Yeah, amazing. And I never left. <laughs> I, I basically <laughs> I thought Vader was so beautiful. We just kept coming back to make projects here. Um, recording in a residential facility is just an experience like no other, especially when it's in the middle of nowhere and there's no distractions. And um, yeah, it just really contributes to making like an incredible record. So. After making a couple of albums here, I got very friendly with the studio owner, Matt Terry, who's a producer, a songwriter, amazing producer. And yeah, he basically put it out there to me and said, do you want to just come and engineer all of my records as well? And at that time, I was kind of freelancing and doing lots of mixing, lots of production bits, lots of different clients in London. And yeah, it was a bit of a gamble, but he basically opened the door to a studio that I could run. Um, so I, I did it and I've been here for about five years now. And it was the best decision actually, because I was quite worried that moving out of London, I'd move away from the rock scene and, you know, all of the sort of bigger clients that I was working with. But what I realized is a lot of bands like to go away and shack up somewhere for a month to make a record. And yeah, that's been invaluable. 
So. Well, th- I was very curious about that because you talked about how like earlier you felt like, oh, like I'm in this small place. There's not enough, not enough work here for me. So I got to go to the big place and, you know, the big city and then you got yeah. busy and then to then go back. Like, you know, I think that there's so many people listening to this that aren't in the big city and they're like, how can I make this work? You know, um, so what do you contribute as being like the reason you're you're so busy out in, in like a remote location? Is it is it just because you're like framing it as a getaway for other artists to go to or, you know, what it is, what is it about that place in particular? Do you think? Yeah, sure. I mean, a massive attraction to this place is the fact that it's, it's isolated, but in a positive way, you know, it's kind of, it's in the middle of nowhere. There's no distractions. Um, it's kind of like, I don't, I don't know what you have in North America, but here we have center parks. <laughs> it's like center parks plus recording. It's, it's like a retreat basically. Um, and yeah, I think when I was younger, I would struggle in a small town to record because there just wasn't that many artists. You know, there wasn't really that many bands to record. And most of them were, you know, pub bands. So they would be available in unsociable hours and at weekends and and everything like that. So when I moved to London, I could make it more of a sort of a day job. But um, making all the connections that I'd made over that time and... Um, you know, I think that word of mouth is super important in our industry. You can do as much advertising and things like that as you like, but if you do a really good job for somebody and they become a return customer, repeat client, that's invaluable. And I think that I've made my career in working with the same artist and helping develop an artist for years and years and years. Um, there's some bands I've been working with for close to 10 years now, um, some even more than that. Um, some artists have gone on and made other bands and... Um, yeah, I find that those kind of artists, when you do a good job for someone, they want you to be a part of their journey and a part of their story. And they'll sort of come around with you. So there's some artists I was working with in Ipswich and then in London and now at Vader. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm super lucky, like, cause I've worked with some incredible producers and some really amazing artists. And I think that that helps to spread sort of the word of the work that you do. Um, and I would say that most of my work these days, I have an amazing manager, but I'd say that a lot of my work these days does come from that repeat custom. I think that's super important. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a really good point to bring up. It's like, you know, I think we all we all try to do our best job, obviously, when we're recording an artist or working on their mixes or whatever. But it's also like it goes beyond just the the scope of your work. It's it's like the experience you provide for someone, right? And and that's the stuff Completely. that like you know if you're if you're a good hang and people want to like be with you and like you know just shoot the shit with you all day long, then like they're gonna want to continue to work with you as opposed to like totally. the person who just does a really good job, but like you don't really want to be in the room with them. Oh, completely. I think it's the most the number one most fundamental thing. We have a wave of assistants coming through here because the kind of uh, level of acts that we work with. It's quite attractive. There's lots of people want to come in and, and get involved. And I say it's the number one most important thing. You've just got to be the kind of right person for, to be in the room of everyone. Um, you can learn a lot of this stuff. You know, I, I went and studied and I had an internship, kind of one of the sort of more traditional routes into it, into this career. But I don't really think you need to have much knowledge coming into the studio. You just need to get the etiquette down like straight away because it's such a fast paced environment. and I think, yeah, the most important thing is just to be like really, really understanding for the artist and to create an environment that they want to create in basically um, and to make them feel, because, you know, we're making music, we're making art here and an artist in their vision, they might be quite vulnerable, you know, and emotions can be really high and a lot of our job can feel like being a counsellor sometimes. Um, and you're just helping the artist channel their work into whatever vision that they, you know, want to create. And I think the most important thing is helping them do that. You know, it doesn't really matter what your knowledge of mics is or what your knowledge of reverb times and things like that is. A lot of that stuff you can just sort of do on the fly. And if it doesn't sound right, you just change it. And, you know, I mentioned Adrian Bushby a minute ago. And I think that was one of the most important things I picked up from Aid is I sort of learned everything from Aid and nothing at the same time. Um, <laughs> In the the first session that I did with him was for a band called Black Foxes and their first record and they tracked all the drums at Assault and Battery which is Blood and Island Moulders facility amazing studio 
amazing live room and they were doing all the overdubs with uh, I think we had about four days at the crypt to do about three or four songs worth of vocals and some guitar stuff so Aid came in with a hard drive and he said hey can you make all these sessions you know root all the outputs make it work with your studio put it all up at the desk all the faders at zero you know everything just kind of at zero root all the outputs because Aid's kind of old school he likes to use a whole console while he records I said yeah great and uh, I kind of you know, did all the Pro Tools outputs, put all the faders at zero, and hit play. And I was stunned. It was one of the most exciting, high energy like recordings I'd ever heard. It sounded mixed, like it was so good. And uh, you know, this is day one of working with him, so I'm not like trying to pick his brain straight away. I'm sort <laughs> of, you know, I'm waiting to see right what Pro Tools plugins are there, like what trigger, what's the secret sample to make the snare sound so good. There was nothing, Mike. There was no samples. There was <laughs> like barely any plugins, like maybe one EQ plugin on a vocal or something to filter it. And I sort of said to Aid, like, is this, is this mix stems? And he's like, what? No, just record it like that. And they blew my mind. I was like, okay, this is, this is real recording now. Like this is, this is what it should sound like going in. Um, so yeah. And basically, I was waiting, you know, that whole session. And we did a few more records together before I really understood that um, his whole thing is about exploring. And like I say, I was just waiting for those secrets, and they never really came. Like it, there was, <laughs> there was no a preset to anything. Um, yeah. I guess the lesson would have been like you just have to take the time to to get the right sound. However, what, you know, however you guys get there. You said he's really into experimenting, so I'm assuming, you know, it was probably experimenting with a lot of mics or positioning, that kind of thing. Like, was that yeah. what you found? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we would use a ton of mics, yeah, for sure. But I think, you know, the, the thing was, it didn't really matter what it was. There was no sort of template format for, for, the, for the band, for the recording, or whatever. Um, we would use so many mics. Like, we did some records together where we'd use 30, 40 mics on the drums. Oh, wow. Like so many different things, loads of different room pairs, loads of options of things. And then we'd go and mix the record afterwards and he'd maybe use the overheads and a room pair and the close mics <laughs> and that would be it. So um, yeah, I think part of the process is being open to just create. And, you know, I kind of think of my role a lot as a creative engineer, which is, so, sort of a term I've been using the last few years when I've been working with a lot of self-producing artists who have the vision for the record. They don't really want to take it to a producer and be told what to do. They want to make their own record, but they essentially they need someone to produce it. Um, you know, more, more than an engineer, they need someone to come up with the systems or to come up with a method or, you know, have some input in, you know, takes and have some input in sounds of things and style of things. So, I've sort of lent more into the creative engineering the last couple of years, working with some artists like Enshikari on their last album. And yeah, I feel that like with that kind of mindset, I'm going into projects with no real boundaries on like no real structure. Like it can be different every single time. And yeah, I just like being really open to help an artist create what they're trying to create without having to say, well, we have to do it this way and you have to, you know, you have to stand there and it could be quite rigid. Like you're, you're kind of, you know, when you're getting into this, you just end up doing whatever you see people do. So the first couple of engineers I'd work with, I'd see how they recorded things, <laughs> anything, drums or vocals. So I would do it that way. But then after a few times, I sort of realized, well, actually that, that person, that performer is quite uncomfortable. You know, that's not, not really the best way for them to perform that vocal, you know, or, you know, maybe they're stood up and they're really rigid and they're out in a live room, sort of, you know, or out in a closet on their own somewhere, like really far away from the band. But what if they're feeling quite vulnerable and they want people around them? Or, you know, what if it just sounds a bit too rigid? What if they want to be sat down? What if they want to hold the mic? You know, if they're a bit nervous about being around this really posh, expensive mic. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically I, I like to think of they're not really being much of a format when I go into a project these days because um, a lot of artists know <laughs> their stuff now and a lot of artists can make amazing recordings at home or at their rehearsal space. And yeah, you don't want to kind of take them away from how they 
create music in the first place and put them into like a rigid format. I like the studio to be pretty relaxed atmosphere because, you know, I want everyone's guards to be down so we can just create sure. together. Yeah. Um, so then when you start a project, you know, it, sure, you have like no boundaries and no set way of doing things, but like, where do you typically begin as far as like establishing what the best approach is going to be? You know, like how, how do you, how do you decide when you're going to, what kind of mics you're going to use or where you're going to position people and that kind of thing? Well, sure. I mean, firstly, it kind of depends on the the vision of the artist and the sound that we're creating. So, you know, if we're doing like a really modern rock record, there is a kind of typical format for doing drums for that. You know, you want a lot of, there's a lot of typical close mics on things, but you know, a lot of people want to take the room mics and things. Um, but every band is completely different. Some band want to play together and everyone stand in a circle in a room looking at each other. And personally, I like making records that way because I like to hear everything like from the get go. I don't really want to be doing the drums to a click track and then the bass to the drums and then the guitar to the, to the bass and the drums. And then, you know, go to do the vocals and then realize, oh, it's not really quick enough. Or <laughs> it's not really, you know, I haven't really captured the feeling right. I like getting a band, everyone playing together straight away. That's just my, you know, personal preference, but not everyone's up for that. So I think having really clear communication with the artists from the get-go is like the most important thing. Yeah, I think that my approach to equipment choice and studio is kind of based on being a, in-house at this amazing facility for the last five years where, um, so Vader's got, an SSL 4000G series, uh, 56 channels, racks and racks of Neve pre's, racks and racks of Thermionic Culture pre's and Avalon pre's and you know, Universal Audio compressors and all the options, all the choice. I've just found there's a few things that I like. There's a few starting points. I don't always do them. So, you know, for, you know, let's say, guitar amp, for example, I'll start with a 57 and a Roya R121, which I think is a classic Jerry Finn thing, which I picked up from uh, Jason Perry, an amazing producer. Um, and I loved his guitar sound. And he said, oh, well, Jerry Finn always did this 57 and a, and a Roya. And that was like the sound of all the bands that I listened to growing up from Linked, Sum 41 to Green Day. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. And all of a sudden I was like, well, okay, that's kind of a guitar sound that I really like. It's got the warmth and the clarity. So I'll start with that. But it doesn't mean it has to be that. And the same with drums. Like I love just keeping it really basic. I love 57 top and bottom of a snare. I love a Beta 91 inside a kick and a FET 47 on the outside or something like that. And we have some Charter Oak mics here, which do that kind of job really well. Um, but it doesn't mean it has to be that. I get bored. And if I feel like the snare drum is not really bright enough before reaching 3Q, I'll just try something else. Just try something that's a bit brighter. Like sometimes a small diaphragm condenser on a snare top can have so much attack and body that you miss from a normal dynamic mic. Um, so yeah, I don't really like to go into something with too much of a, a template because I'm not trying to create the same record over and over and over here. You know, I know that's a kind of <laughs> controversial point because a lot of people do have their template because they know what the gear does. That's the control element. And then the bit that changes is, is the artist, right? And what you're creating. But yeah, like I said, I'm not trying to create the same record over and over again. Like I tend to learn what I like through the process and what I don't like. But, you know, at the end of the day, some mics suit a certain sound and a certain style or a certain performer and they just don't suit others. We have some mics. We've got a, a Telefunken U47 here, which is, oh, it's got to be at least a $10,000 mic, maybe more, probably more. Um, and it sounds incredible on some singers. It just sounds amazing, larger than life. It just sounds like a record straight away. But I'll always put it up against an SM7 or a U87, something that costs 10 times less. And a lot of the time, the SM7 will be the right mic for that singer. And I don't really like to sit around and compare things for too long. Usually, a singer feels comfortable in front of a certain thing. Some of them like singing into a really expensive, nice valve microphone. A lot of singers know you know, the difference between all these mics now as well. But at the end of the day, it's just whatever works, totally. you know, and, and if they want to hold it, an SM7 is great for that because you can sort of hold the mic and get involved with it or 
you know, I've, I've made a, a record with Public Image a couple of years ago and John Lydon does all of his vocals into an SM58 and it's it's just a performance and it's just the first time I saw him do it um, I was assisting on that record so I was at the back of the room with some headphones on and I was just like wow it's John Lydon done in a take just into a 58 and you wouldn't sort of listen to the record and think oh it's not a posh expensive Neumann or something like that yeah. just listen to the record and go that's John Lydon you know I yeah. think a lot of the time we can get really carried away with gear and I've been in a lot of sessions a lot of situations where you know studio time costs a lot of money and the band aren't here for very long and they're here for the amount of time that they can afford but you'll see some like producers and engineers get carried away and be plugging in gear for days and testing out different things for days and dialing in sounds over and over and over again and there's definitely a method in the madness, but I like to just move quick. For sure. If something that I personally really like isn't working, I'll just change it. I agree. I'm there to make that artist's vision come to life. I'm not there to, you know, compare different models of SM7s and things like that. Of course. That. There's a time to, uh, I, I think sometimes like that process of like auditioning everything sometimes that's just like the engineer trying to learn in the process and then like sometimes there's just like you know they're just doing it all for themselves and not for the artists and and you know that just like to me i think that can really kill the vibe of a, of a pro, of a recording session like you know sure like set up set up your 47 against your sm7 and like have your expensive versus cheap and make that comparison and then you know move on you know <laughs> like but oh, but, for sure. but i also yeah, think yeah, too yeah. that like it's one of those things where you're now experienced with this. You now understand what each of those mics sounds like. You've seen it on lots of different singers. So you have the, you, you're going into your sessions with at least some sort of um, insight into like, okay, this mic works great with this style of singer or, you know, with this style of drummer or whatever. So like that allows you to make those decisions and work much faster. And, you know, if your first instinct isn't the right choice, well, then you try something else and then you move on. Right. And then, so like, I think that's where your speed must come from. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. I, I feel that like, you know, there is a lot of exploring to do and I love gear, don't get me wrong, like I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> I think we all are. That's part of the reason why we got into this, right? Because we just love buying gear. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, we're there to make a record and budgets are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and I don't think that's just a UK-based thing. You know, I have some friends that work in studios around the world and we're all sort of saying the same thing, you know, where we used to have a month to make a record and I was told by some of you know, my mentors, that wasn't very long and it was such a rush. But I was like, wow, a whole month to make a record. And, you know, that's gone down to about two weeks now. And with some artists, they come in for two days to do the drums for a record and then they'll go and finish it themselves. Maybe send it back for mixing or come back in to, you know, do some grand piano or something that they don't have access to at home. So we just have to move fast. You know, it is a very fast paced environment. Um, I, I mean, I would like to slow down and explore a bit more sometimes. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, you're just there to make killer music, right? Yeah, you're just there to make awesome songs for the artist. And love that. You know, I don't think that, you know, I mentioned some producers that are a bit slower in finding sounds. I don't think it's because they were like selfish or anything or like trying to spend ages. I think it's just you get distracted, you get carried away. And sometimes you lose that objectivity. You know, I can decide really quick if I like the sound of something or not needs to be brighter or not. And I think that came from working with producers like Aid, who just makes decisions so fast and then moves on um, and commits as well. Um, I like to make a lot of commitments outside in the analog world before it all goes to Pro Tools. So, you know, I mentioned having a couple of mics on guitar cabs. Sometimes I'll multi-mic the same drum, you know, Tom's top and bottom, things like that. They'll, they'll, I'll make that decision, that balance, and it gets bust together on the SSL and just goes in like that because I don't need to change that balance later. Like if I've got a guitar part going through two or three different amps and each cab has two, maybe three speakers on it, it can be anywhere between six and nine audio tracks straight away. I'll make a mix and I'll bust them all together. Unless it's a stereo part, maybe they'll go into two channels, but it's usually down to one. Um, I find that that method of commitment just makes you make the right decisions because if you take all the options for playing with later, you end up not really finding what the vision is. But I find that, you know, if I'm bussing six mics together, I can then put those six mics through an EQ 
And when I look to the guitarist and I'm like, what do you think? Is this great? And they're like, a little brighter. Say the amps are as bright as they can be or, you know, say there's no real way of doing it other than EQing those six mics. Well, I'm just going to do it with one EQ and I'll commit. And it goes in True. that way and stays that way. Um, you know, I will take lots of options, like just in case, you know, sometimes. Always take a DI for things. And like with, with drums, I like to take lots of different mics because I find that in the mix, I can add loads more movement across a mix by having lots of different options, having, having a sound for the verse and then a sound for the chorus that might be a bit bigger or a bit smaller depending on the song. Um, so I always record lots of options. So I can manipulate it later. But yeah, certainly for the sound of things and the tone for things, I'll just commit because we're not there to, like I say, play with gear. Like It's my job. I get to do it every day. I'm very, very fortunate I get to do that. But um, the artist might only be in there for two or three days. For sure. And they've you know saved loads of money or you know whatever. Like I'm coming in the next day with another band. So I just want to make sure that they get what they want out of it. That's the most important thing. And there's something to be said too for like when you have multiple mics going on, like in that example that you gave of like having multiple cabinets with multiple mics, it's like in the moment you're trying to like, you're always trying to like create a rough mix for the artist to feed off of anyway. So like in the moment when you combine all those mics and you get a sound that you like, that's what they're that's what they're playing to in the studio. So it's like just capture that moment and like, you know, like you said, like they'll they'll be excited by the sound that you have up there. And if they're not, you're gonna change it in the moment. And and then once you've found that sound that everyone can agree is is nice, then like just move on. Commit that, move it on. And then and then that makes yeah. everything moving like forward from there, like with editing and mixing easier, because then you're only editing one track of guitars instead yeah. of like nine tracks and and then mixing yeah. one track instead of nine tracks, all that kind of stuff. So it's really just about like feeling what's inspiring in the moment and capturing that and, and making your life a lot easier moving forward. Oh, completely. Yeah. And like I say, having the the vision, I think is the most important thing. You can get lost in the madness, you know, multi-track recording, Pro Tools, Logic, whatever. Your door session can be hundreds of tracks and all that scrolling. You know, you mentioned editing, like the workflow, it just slows everything down. And I've never opened up a mix in here and gone, oh, you know what? I wish that one Royer microphone on that left guitar overdub that we triple tracked i wish that was a bit quieter that's never <laughs> happened so you know maybe one day i'll listen to something and, and think that but knowing me i'll just put another eq on and just shelve off the bottom end or something because for sure <laughs> you know there's all these steps to make as long as you're moving forward and i think a lot of steps you can move backwards um and i, I like to move forwards um and yeah i think it's really important making a song sound like a record straight away like it needs to sound mixed i track with the quad bus compressor on all the time it starts on from tracking because i need it to sound like a record i need when the artist comes back when the drummer comes back and doing the drum take and listens to it i want that person to be flawed by how good it sounds you know i want it to sound like they're headlining a massive festival like if, if it's you know say if it's a high energy rock thing it needs to be a high energy rock thing from the get-go and it doesn't really matter how many microphones you got because you can have 40 microphones, but if it doesn't sound like a high energy record, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that having the artist vision is like super important straight away. Um, we see a lot of artists I'm working with these days coming in with demos that sound like a record. You know, a lot of artists can self produce themselves now to a point where the demo is often becoming unbeatable. And sometimes we'll open up a song and, go to retract the guitars and we just can't find that tone or we go to retrack a vocal and the performance was just right at the beginning. So I'm always quite mindful of being with the artist on their vision. And you know, if we're tracking something that's quite complex, say it's strings or drums or something like where there is lots of mics going on. And I tried to do all of that engineering really early before the artist gets there and just get all of that set up. And then to the point where I'm not even really thinking about it because Sometimes I'll have an assistant on a session, but I don't often have an engineer who will engineer for me when I'm producing. So I like to make all of those decisions and just think, well, I've done that now. I don't have to think about that again. And, you know, go into mix mode. So when I'm sat there, get, you know, getting all the takes, I'll be balancing. And I'll be getting it to a point where when they hear the playback, when they hear the comp, I need it to sound amazing. Um, I need it to sound like their vision. Um, for me, that's the most important thing in the studio is just 
being with the artists, like seeing through their eyes or hearing the song through their ears. Um, you know, we all have our personal tastes and there's oftentimes artists who need a bit of direction or they need a bit of encouragement. And, you know, I reference a lot of stuff that I've worked on or, you know, there's a lot of great mixes out there. There's a lot of amazing producers doing amazing work. So I never really feel lost for inspiration at any point. But yeah, I feel that like at least helping the artist go their direction is kind of the most important thing. Um, and if they need a bit of help in finding it, not trying to give them someone else's sound, yeah, you know, helping them find what works for them. For sure. And a lot of the time that is exploring and it is <laughs> doing things over and over and over again and to the point of madness, but it's all part of fun, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, when you, when you get it, you're like, wow, that was it. That's the sound we were after the whole time. So yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that's really cool. Like, you know, that you have that kind of open-minded approach to to tracking artists and you know i i i think that that is how most people should do it it's like you kind of learn by experience like when you move a mic here or there it's going to impact the sound this way or that way but you you just store all that information so that when you have a need for it you act on it and like that allows you to work faster but ultimately fulfill the artist's vision like you were talking about there right so um oh completely yeah, yeah. i mean i feel really inspired by sylvia massey who i know you've spoken yeah. with um and yeah, Sylvia's uh, book, the recording book, is just full of endless, <laughs> e- endless ideas for That's how crazy. to record something. And, you know, we end up being an encyclopedia of how to do things. Um, but quite often I feel that that can get in the way because you can just spend too long thinking about that and not actually thinking, you know, a lot of the time, like I say, if I'm engineering on my own productions, I'll get that out of the way. I'll, I'll do all the engineering the day before the band gets set because I just know I've got stuff set up and I mm-hmm. can change it. But when everyone's playing together, say I'm the fifth member of the band with some headphones on in the live room, sometimes I'm playing a guitar, sometimes I'm just jumping up and down trying to feel the song. I don't really want to be thinking about the EQ of the snare drum mic in that moment. I want to be thinking about the song. Um, and I want to be, you know, completely attentive to what the artist needs. Yeah. Um, because I can be busy thinking about what's this compressor doing to the kick out mic and how that's maybe flipping the phase with the bottom snare or something. And the artist might be asking me a question of, you know, what do you think of the the riser in the pre-chorus? <laughs> what do you think of this vocal, which I've been thinking about for months? And I need to be thinking about what they're thinking about. So there's yeah. lots of different things going on all, all, at any one time. Totally. Yeah, there's definitely a time and place to experiment. I even heard with Sylvia that like, you know, let's say an artist books 14 days with her. It's it's maybe like days one to 10. It's like engineering, just standard engineering. And then the last few days are like the experimenting days. And those are the days you get to like go crazy and try new things. And I don't know if that is actually her approach or not. So I heard, just heard that somewhere, but I think that that is a, a really cool approach to um, being creative in the, in the studio and like still getting your work done. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, that's yeah. so rad. Yeah. I, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised because her records sound the best. So Totally. It would she's, make sense. she's amazing. Yeah. And her book, like I just recently reread her book and it's just, it blows my mind. And some of the, the, the creative decisions she's made and, and like, it, yeah, it, just, it would be so much fun to work with her. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 Well, I'd, I'd love to dive into some elements of your productions that, that I really like, cool. um, and, uh, learn a little bit more about some of your processes there. Um, and one thing that I noticed when I was listening to a lot of your work is that a lot of your tracks tend to have a lot of width to them. Like, I feel like the guitars will be really wide. The vocals will sound really wide. Um, and I just feel like there's a lot of, like, really cool ear candy. Like, uh, that's what I call it. Like, ear candy that would be, like, on the left and right. Like, it just kind of bounces out and it sticks out, but it just, like, it's tasteful. It's fun. You know, it keeps things entertaining in a mix. So when it sure. comes to creating width in your productions, what are some of your go-to approaches for for doing that? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, it's really, really subjective. But I say, like, most of the time I'm recording, you know, guitar rock bands mm-hmm. um, and the primary colors of that are you know drum space guitars and I feel that um, like I'm pretty punk rock when it comes to panning like I'm pretty hardcore I'm left center or right that like, there's not really much going on in the middle with the primary color stuff so most guitars tend to be like super wide 100% left or right um, and I feel that it's like the details in the middle that help you reference like helps your ear reference to how wide that mix is because you know, there's a saying that if everything's wide, nothing's wide. 
Like, I think I think it's like a mastering saying um, that I picked up once, and it's kind of true because you know it, it, the, the stereo width is only as wide as the listener's image, be it headphones or you know laptop speakers. But you can really play with that by moving their focus. So if I've got some, say, the main rhythm guitars are hard left and right, I might pan the vocals slightly in from that to make the guitars feel wider or vice versa. Say I want the vocals to be the widest thing. I won't let anything else get into that territory. Um, but yeah, the like primary color stuff, that like, tends to be like super wide straight away. And then I do a lot of the heavy lifting in my mixes on the mix bus. So I do like, that's where I'll start. Call it a top down approach. Once I've got the balance up, it's I mostly mix my own productions. So there'll be a rough mix as a starting point. And I'll jump right in. Like I said, I want it to sound like a record straight away. So sometimes I'll start with the faux mastering stuff and get it super loud and get it to a point where I'm like, okay, this is this sounding like commercial volume. This is sounding really exciting. And then I work down from there. And a lot of the time on my mix bus, I'll have some mid-side stereo width stuff going on. Um, I like a lot of the Plugin Alliance plugins. Um, there's one Shadow Hills mastering Love bus compressor, thing. which, oh, it's, it's amazing. But you don't really need to do much with it, you know. I'll just tickle it, but just the sound of going through that one. They've got this one called the Class A model, which is red. Um, obviously, they're both digital, so they really know yeah, what yeah. it's obviously the modeling of it. It's based on a, a Class A version. Um, but it's got a great stereo width knob, and sometimes I'll automate that. So say everything's wide, 100% wide, but I want the chorus to be even wider. I'll just automate it to do that. Um, but yeah, I think you know you can really guide the listener into making them think something's wide when it's not so I'm mixing a record at the moment for a London based band called Jaws of Shark uh, it's their debut album and the, the sort of the main format of that band is guitarist singer bass player and drummer it's power trio and you know it's that thing of well if we stereo track the guitars and pan them left and right like does it really sound that wide? So I'll take a song and we will do like the verse in mono or do the intro in mono or maybe like just slightly wide left and right guitars. And when it gets to the chorus, that's when the hard left and right ones can come in. So I think it's about playing with when I use that. Like I say, I'm not really that picky about where I place things too much. Like I'm pretty extreme. If I want it to go wide left and right, I'll just go wide. And if I want it to sound wider, I'll put some mid-side trickery on there um but yeah i think i feel that like mixes can really travel when i play with that and so you know like i say i'll automate the the mid-side stereo thing quite a bit um i do that on my drum bus as well so sometimes i want the verse to sound a little bit more narrow and have the image of the drummer sort of in the middle of the mix and say it gets to the chorus and maybe the room mics will come up to make the chorus sound a bit more full and explosive I'll also add, I don't know, ten percent, fifteen percent—a tiny fraction of an amount, but something that you can hear, something that you can just notice. It sounds a little sparklier, it's a little bit wider. Um, I guess that it's just a balance of the sides coming up against the mid image. But um, I think that if you have it set so things are just panned left and right, and they stay there for the whole mix, and it's just static, then there's not really much width. It's about the travel. It's about the movement. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's it's creating that. Um, yeah, it's creating that that contrast as far as uh, your verses and choruses, and it's also creating um, just movement as far as like it sounds like you use automation, or maybe you just maybe you have yeah, certain tracks that are panned in, certain tracks that are panned out, that kind of thing. I think tons, that that yeah. that um, that makes a lot of sense. It's like you're you're just expanding the, the 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 stereo image for people in the choruses and, that, and that's how it feels like it explodes and it would get bigger so that makes a lot of sense to do it that way um and then the, even like using you said you use like the stereo widening stuff like yeah that definitely has its time and place too um as far as like when you're you know you gave that example of like you know uh doing a lot of rock stuff where you'll like typically pan hard left and right with guitars do you ever yeah. find that when you're double tracking, do you change the tones for the left and right, or do, are they this, usually the same? What's your approach there? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, 
again, it, it's, it's pretty subjective, but say if there's, there's one guitarist or playing a, a part that's just double tracked, we'll try different guitars. You know, sometimes I'll be tracking for two or three different amps and there'll be a balance that's like the main rhythm tone. So we can either try pedals, try guitars. Um, I like to double track with two different distortion pedals. So often I'll get, um, we've got a 70s JMP here and I've actually got a little homebrew amp called the Percolator, um, which I made when I was a teenager. And it was just it was just because I couldn't afford a valve amp at the time, so I bought all the bits to make one and spent my teenage years in my bedroom doing things like that. Um, but it's actually really good. It needs a service, but I can't remember how I made it. <laughs> <laughs> and no one else could service it. But yeah, so I'll sometimes have the JMP and that going, or you know something like a Mesa Boogie uh, or a PV. Um, and you know, th- those three or four amps might all be blended together. They'll all be set so that, I mean, you know, completely project dependent, like sound dependent. And obviously guitarists have their own amps as well, yeah. but a lot of the time we'll be tracking just onto the edge of distortion. So get the amps cooking to a point where, you know, we can use things like boosters or distortions to push them into real distorted territory. So I've got a few different pedals that I like. I love the Boss DS1. Like it's super simple and it just works and it sounds completely different to a Boss Blues driver um, or an MXR micro amp. So I think just changing that can really change the left and right because it's, it, it, you know, with, it's with guitars, for example, like it's really about the mid range. You know, everything's about the mid range, like the, the character of a vocal is all mid range um, information. And I feel that like, the width on stereo guitars comes from having a slight shift in where the mids are. So, you know, say if like the first take on the left, right, low mid heavy, maybe the one on the right is more upper mid heavy and the two will sort of balance out. Um, But I think with, you know, just going back a step to talking about automating width and things, I mix on a C24 digital design console. Um, It's kind of old now. (laughs) I bought it off a producer that I used to work with a lot um, and that's how I learned to mix was I was on this desk and the great thing about working with flying faders is you can just move the mix all the time so I'll get a quick balance up with it and then I'll do my master bus sort of stuff to get it sounding loud straight away and exciting like a record and then sometimes I'll go away and I'll come back to have that objectivity and I'll do the refining and all the little bits I need to do to make all the tones fit together. But then I'm really quickly back to the faders and I'm moving things loads and loads and loads. Um, and some sessions are like hundreds of tracks. So I'll bustle those together into auxes and I'll just show the auxes on my desk um, so I can get to a chorus and I can push like the, the hard panned guitars left and right. I can push those up in the chorus and away from you know, the rhythm guitar that was going through the verse, which is up the middle or maybe slightly off to one side. Um, I think that travel is the most important thing because even with having a different sounding amp on the left and a different sounding amp on the right, like you've just got left and right. So mm. it's only going to sound as wide as what the listener is listening to. If you can move it and if you can take their focus back into the middle of the song and then back out to the sides, that's where I think the width comes from. Um there's also so a lot of trickery and mastering. Like sometimes I feel like, right, this mix is great. Like this is exactly what I want. And it comes back from my mastering engineer sounding even wider. And I'm like, dude, you're some <laughs> wizard. <laughs> I don't know how you've done that, but. Um, yeah. Well, that's cool. And then I definitely agree. I think that that, that movement is such a, a cool technique. And it's one of those things that a lot of people don't even think to do, but it, it can make a real big difference. Um, another element of your of your productions that I really like too is is your vocals and to me they kind of follow a similar approach to some degree where I feel like and correct me if I'm wrong but I feel like when I listen to a lot of your productions like your vocals tend to have some sort of modulation on them like I feel like I can hear like yeah. slight chorusing on them or something like yeah. that they're not just like super dry and like you know just like a raw vocal like I, I feel like there is a little bit of modulation to them either through chorusing or something else um, and uh, I'm curious to know like you know, as far as getting your vocals to sound more interesting and, and giving them some extra, you know, maybe some width or whatever, you know, is, yeah. is that typically your approach there, using some chorusing there? Yeah, loads. Um, I have a bit of a template, um, not with settings, but just more with starting points for things. 
Um, and I'll use that when I'm tracking. Um, and I'll basically, when I'm doing vocals, I'll have one auxiliary send called Vox Vibes. And that's it. <laughs> and it just goes, just, just one. And that goes on all of the vocal tracks. And that returns, sometimes it's 20 times in a mix. There'll be 20 different auxes going with different things on. Things like choruses, stereo, width sort of things. Um, they tend to be on those auxes and they're just tucked in. So I can I can ride those in a mix on my desk. They tend to be the last sort of 20 faders in a mix page for me. Um, you know, right after the vocals it tends to be the effects. And the travel of those is super important. So I think the stereo width you might be hearing is coming from Sound Toys Microshift, which oh, is love that um, yeah, a dimension D kind of thing. I have the dimension C pedal, which I'll track keys and things like that too. Sometimes if I want a bit more width through a stereo guitar part, I'll put it through the dimension C and just commit that up front. But um, yeah, that kind of thing with vocals is amazing. Um, I use Isotope's vocal synth a lot. The width knob in that is that does some magic stuff as well. Not really sure what's going on there, but you can you can put the width of the dry vocal up to like two hundred percent, and all of a sudden there's a lot of mid side um, trickery going on. But yeah, I remember listening to um, remember when Kanye's album Jesus came out, and um, the track Black Skinhead is quite simple in its production. Like it's just a floor tom, some bass, and then this crazy chaotic bass guitar thing with the vocal right at the middle. Every now and then there's a shout that comes in in, in through the verse. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but if you go and check it out, there's a shout that happens in the verse like four or five times for each verse. And it's almost like the phase is completely flipped because I've tried listening to it on my phone. I don't really notice it, but in headphones, it like sounds like someone's behind you. And things like that really excite me. Like I kind of want, it depends on the song and it depends if that's the artist's vision, but I love vocals that just reach out and grab you in a mix. And it's quite hard to do that without the vocal then shouting down the rest of the song. You know, especially in rock music, it's, you get a balance of everything happening music wise. And sometimes it's really hard to find a place for the vocal to fit in on the top. And you end up carving a load of mid range out in the guitars maybe carving some of the lower warmth out the bass guitar, and sometimes even riding the drum bus just to make room for the vocal because in a commercial rock song, everything's loud, right? Um, so I find that things like stereo image, um, spatial processing, let's call it, I find that's really important to help locate a vocal in a mix because you've got loads of big wide things going on. The, gets, the vocal can just sound quite lone in the middle and rather than just tracking loads and loads and loads of them and having it sort of fighting the volume of the guitars, just playing with things like that. Like I'll also EQ that micro shift and maybe it will just be the treble that's coming through that. And I'll get this like super airy kind of um, presence off the lead vocal. Just so it sounds a bit wider so it has a bit more space in the mix. It won't necessarily be doing loads of chorusing and stuff, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of all the isotope stuff like the the vocal plugins they have vocal synth is it's a go-to for me yeah i Absolute love that go-to i, I yeah. love that you mentioned like the the micro shift i i, I think that that's on that the micro shift and the dimension d are probably on 90 percent of 95 percent of my mixes I, I feel like i always have that on yeah. it's part of my template it's like you know that, yeah. that thing is just like it does something magical to vocals and uh it can just give you like yeah, you can get that width out of it if you want, if you don't have double-tracked vocals, but it also just can give your vocals like this extra little bit of like thickening, but without it sounding too boring and dry. You know, like there's something, there's some some magic to it that's that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And I'll automate panning effects and things like that as well. So if I've got uh, one of my returns or a few of them are mono spring reverbs, because I find that springs are a bit, they have a really interesting character to them, you know, and, and with them being mono, if it's a you know if it's a mono sort of source, you can really like play with the placement of that. So, say if I've got like one guitar part or one vocal going on that's hanging out somewhere over the left side of the mix, I'll oppose that with a reflection on the right. That will make it sound wider because if it's out on the left on its own, or maybe the effect is also on the left with it, it might just be further back from you as a listener. 
But if I place the reflection of it, mono spring reverb, a uh, slap delay, something like that on the other side, you get this, uh, this kind of pseudo stereo effect of, well, you're in a big space because the reflection of it is over on the other side of the mix. And I feel that like that, automating those effects um, is probably where, yeah, a lot of the space comes from on the vocals in my mixes. Yeah, that's that's very cool. Yeah, and I think you know it is it is good to talk about you know using these sort of tools as opposed to layering, right? Like I think a lot of people have this feeling that if you just layer things, things sound bigger and fuller, and sometimes that can just definitely make the thing make your mix sound really muddy and too almost too dense, right? Oh, sure, straight away. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, if everything's loud, what's loud? True. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can you can just overlay and overlay and overlay, but does it add any more feeling to the song? You know, to the performance. Sometimes I feel that like a double tracked vocal, you can lose a little bit of the vulnerability in it. You can lose a little bit of the emotion in it. It can be completely subjective, of course, but yeah, I think that making those decisions while whilst tracking is probably the biggest part of of directing where a mix is going because. I'm making all those decisions early on if if it's a track that I've produced. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time, say if I'm starting with a folder of stems from an artist, because I'm really fortunate I get to work on some amazing projects from artists all around the world now. And I, sometimes I'm sent a session and I can start with their rough mix, but sometimes I'm just sent a folder of stems. And a lot of artists that track themselves, they might be quite insecure about the way that they sound. So they will layer up Four of them, four of each thing, be it like vocals, harmonies, guitars, lead things. Trying to fit all of those things in at any one point can be quite a challenge. So, yeah, I feel that kind of making those decisions as to where something lives, but then playing around with it, like grabbing the listener's attention. You know, maybe if there's a lead guitar over to the right for most of the song, but it's got a moment in between a vocal for it to really speak, right? It's up front and center. And then it goes back again. Like I, I just really, I love the travel that you can get through automating mixes. I think that's probably the, the most important thing that makes something sound interesting and exciting because you can slap any kind of effect on something. It's like, oh, cool, chorus. And, you know, a verse goes by and is the, you know, is the vocal sound the same? Like the, <laughs> the chorus or the modulation that's on it, if that doesn't change... Is it that exciting or is it just a tone? Is it just a color? That's a good, really great way of looking at it. Like, yeah, if you, if everything is the same throughout the whole track, like it, yeah, you're, it sounds cool at the beginning, but then you get tired of it. So you have to, you have to have that, uh, travel as you, as you say, right? Like I, I definitely think that that's, um, that's how you keep mixes interesting. You know, you don't want to just keep being yeah. static. Right. Yeah. And, totally. I mean, even on a, the, even at the most basic level, like there's a lot of people that don't even use automation and like, even if you're just automating volume, that in itself mm-hmm. can make your mix sound more exciting. But then once you start going even deeper and you start introducing yeah. like modulation or effects and you pl- you automate that kind of stuff, then like you you just have like this whole new landscape to play with that that makes it really cool. Yeah. Oh, completely. Yeah. I mean, I know there's a lot of alternatives to the the C24 that I'm using, um, and I am looking to downsize at some point. Um, mostly because I know this is going to get discontinued at some point. So. I, I I kind of don't want to see the day where I can't I can't turn on and it works with Pro Tools anymore. <laughs> um, so I will have to change soon. But I love having twenty four faders in front of me, and I don't know. I'm just very used to where everything is on this. Um, I sat behind it for years now, and I think yeah, the most important thing for me is to feel like I can get hands in on a mix. I don't always, you know, I'll do a lot of the mix stuff with a mouse, um, and I'll go through track by track and and sort of you know discover what I want things to be that way but if I'm setting up a song for the first time if I've sent a folder it could be 100 200 stems sometimes I want to get hold of that really really quick and I've, I just find for me personally a mouse is really slow so being able to just balance things on the first couple of times of listening to it and making sure that it sounds kind of cool straight away um, that's really important and then when it comes to doing automation it's amazing how you know you think of things as as moving one thing at a time and that comes from having one mouse or one trackpad but when you've got i mean i've got what eight fingers and two thumbs <laughs> um or three thumbs 
So I'm from <laughs> Norfolk. It's a, it's a kind of joke. Um, yeah, I, you can move multiple things at the same time. And sometimes I'll have, you know, focus on four or five buses that I'll be automating at the same time or, you know, a few different vocals that I'm automating at the same time because, again, it's, you know, if you're just moving one thing at a time, is it really that interesting? Is it really that exciting? Does it have any space? Say you want the vocal to be louder in, um, you know, say if you're working on a section that gets more and more climactic as it goes on, say it's the middle eight of a song and it gets to a really epic bit at the end and the vocal needs to be louder. Well, if you turn the vocal up, like, sometimes you don't really have any space for it. Um, you know, if you're already hitting the loudest point of your mix and you want something to be even louder, you kind of have to make a space for it. So rather than just turn the vocal up to a 3 dB, I'll grab whatever's around it as well and pull that down. So if there's anything that's got a vocal tone to it, brass or strings or guitars, pull that down a little bit whilst I'm pushing the vocal up. And being able to do that in one move, in like one pass of automation, is what I think gives my mixes the travel that I look for. And it means I can work to the speed that I want to work at. Because if I had to do all of that with a mouse, it would probably take twice as long, maybe longer. <laughs> um, <laughs> Totally. I, I love that. I think and I think that, you know, this is this has been a theme of this episode, I think, is just like having this movement in your mixes and and understanding how everything is in relation to something else. And so you always have to be thinking of the of how all of the ingredients of the mix come together and how they all work and interact with each other and how they create that movement. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's a, that's a really great point to bring home with this episode. Um, and uh, certainly I hope that people listening to it are getting a lot of great ideas about like where they can automate things and how they can experiment with all this motion and, and all that kind of stuff there too. So um, George, thank you so much for, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but thank you so much for, for hopping on here and, and sharing all this stuff. I think it's really useful and um, definitely some stuff for people to think about. So I really appreciate you being here today. Oh, it's been great chatting with you, Mike. Thanks for having me. Right on, man. Uh, if people want to learn more about you and potentially even work with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, from my website, georgeperks.com. Uh, I'm on all the social medias, at Producer Perks. Um, and yeah, I'm managed by one of my closest mates, Ben Ward at Don't Try Music. Um, and he does a lot of work with artists as well, like helping with their campaigns and developing artists. And um, we do quite a lot of that stuff together. So check out Don't Try Music. Ben's got some great things to offer too. Right on, man. Thanks again for everything. I really appreciate it. Cool. Thank you. So that was my interview with George Perks. I really enjoyed that one. Really enjoyed learning more about his process of creating mixes that have movement in them. And I loved how he got into different things like panning positioning and modulation and just creating contrast, all that kind of stuff. I think it's so important. And if you're struggling to make your mixes sound exciting, you should definitely take a lot of the things he said here into consideration and try them out in your own mixes because they definitely work and they can make your song sound really exciting, really big. And at the end of the day, that's exactly what we want with our mixes, right? And I also appreciated the fact that he calls it creative engineering, which I think is really cool. And I love his approach to working with no boundaries, as he said, you know, and treating every project as its own unique thing, which I think is really important. You want every project to stand out on its own and you don't want everything to sound the same, right? So by treating every project as its own unique thing and then having unique approaches to how you actually track the instruments, I think that that's what makes albums sound special. And so it's really cool to hear him talk about how he approaches projects like that. So yeah, I really enjoyed that episode. I got a lot out of it. I hope that you did too. If you did, please make sure to subscribe to the podcast. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live each and every Wednesday morning. And also, if you're struggling with your mixes, if you just can't seem to get them to sound as good as your favorite records, and you're not quite sure what to do with it, then I would love to help you out. And inside of my coaching program, Amplitude, you can get one-on-one -on -one personalized support to help you get your tracks sounding just as good as you've always wanted to hear them. And we work with you throughout the entire process, whether it's recording, editing, Editing or mixing, whatever your songs need to help them get to that level, that's what we work with you on. And we go back and forth on your tracks until you are completely satisfied. So if you've ever felt like your mixes just don't quite stack up and you're not sure of what to do, or maybe you just don't have anyone to bounce ideas off of or get advice from, that's exactly what you're going to get inside of this program. And we give you the step-by-step -step actions to take to get that sound that you want. That way you can get your songs finished, you can do them fast, you can gain a process so that with every other song that you work on, you know exactly what to do. And ultimately, that allows you to 
Put your music out faster, get gigs faster, get sync deals faster, get radio play faster, press whatever it is that your goals are. That's what we work with you on inside of this program. So if you're interested in learning more about this program, make sure to visit masteryourmix.com forward slash amplitude. And that's where you can find all the details. And on there, there's a form to fill out. You can request a free demo of the program. And then I'd love to hop on a call with you to learn more about your goals, what your current processes are, where you're feeling stuck, and to see how I can truly help you. And if it seems like we can help you inside of this program, then I would love to invite you in there and help you make your music sound incredible. So once again, make sure to visit masteryourmix.com forward slash amplitude to get all the details there. And with that said, we've reached the end of this episode. Thank you so much for sticking around. I can't wait to chat with you in the next one. Talk soon. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com. Mix.com.